So we come to the end of this brief lecture series and really we've only had a chance to scratch the surface of this highly complex subject but I hope at least you'll go away and ask questions and keep an open mind. The synthesis of this lecture, this final lecture, is really my view um, formed over the last 25 to 30 years of being in this field and in creating this lecture series. And start again with the, the ghost of Louis Pasteur, the great Louis Pasteur, who perceived this to be a war upon infectious disease, man against microbe. He said, if it is a terrifying thought that life is at the mercy of the multiplication of these minute bodies, is it at least a consoling hope that science will not always remain powerless before such enemies. And so it was that returning from holiday to his laboratory at St. Mary's Hospital, London on September the 3rd, 1928, Dr. later Sir Alexander Fleming began to sort through Petri dishes containing colonies of the Staphylococcus bacterium. Mold growing in one dish was inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. And as Pasteur remarked in 1854, in the fields of observation, chance favours only the prepared mind. Well, Fleming's prepared mind determined that his mold juice was capable of killing a wide range of harmful bacteria, such as Streptococcus, Meningococcus and the diphtheria bacteria. It was left to Howard Florey and Ernst Chain and their colleagues at the University of Oxford who turned penicillin from a laboratory curiosity into a life-saving drug. And so, with the introduction of penicillin in the 1940s, began the era of antibiotics and a turning point in the war on infectious disease, widely recognised as one of the greatest advances in medicine. The outcome of diseases like syphilis, battlefield gangrene and scarlet fever were rewritten. But as we know, within 100 years, the dream had turned to nightmare, miracle to apocalypse. Bacterial resistance from increasingly dangerous bacteria was driven by at least four factors. Inappropriate use, your child just has a pink eardrum, so we'll put them on amoxicillin, for example. Greed, the drug company is putting more and more powerful antibiotics into first-line therapy, encouraging doctors to use them in advance of simpler drugs the widespread use of antibiotics in animal husbandry, but most importantly, evolution, most importantly, the survival imperative, the collective ability of these extraordinary organisms to mutate, to change, to adapt, and to survive, to develop resistance to the antibiotics. So, less than 80 years, the blink of an eye in the geological ancestry of this planet the UK's chief medical officer warns that in light of the growing threat of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, the antibiotic apocalypse may already be upon us, heralding the end of modern medicine. But why measles? This was my question for so long. Why the headlines? Why the scares? Why the Disneyland experience? Why Romania? Why around the world do we hear time and time again about measles? The killer disease. Measles makes a comeback. Measles, as we know, as we've seen in this lecture series, was becoming a milder and milder and milder disease rapidly over time, and there was nothing to suggest that it was not going to continue to change, to become milder, uh, beyond the point of introduction of vaccines with nothing to do with the vaccine at all. So why this anxiety about what was perceived historically to be a rite of passage for children, a trivial disease? Are vaccines destined for a similar fate to antibiotics? Is that the problem? You see, antibiotics that are only partially effective against a bacteria create a selection pressure favouring the survival of resistant strains. For vaccines, like measles vaccine, resistance equates to strains of the virus 
that can elude an imperfect immunity created by the vaccine? The answer is yes. In fact, we're already seeing vaccine resistance with pertussis vaccine, and it's certainly a feature of vaccines against organisms like pneumococcus and human papillomavirus, where there are multiple subtypes or serotypes of the virus, where nature, abhorring a vacuum, substitutes one subtype of the organism for another that is not affected by the vaccine. But what of measles? Should we fear it? The answer is yes. Why? Because all of the vain assumptions that were made about our ability to mutate, to exploit, and to exert dominion over this virus have been thwarted, have been proven wrong. Because nature will haunt the high ceilings of our ambition. Nature will find a way. A measles outbreak or a measles vaccine is not one single thing. It's important to understand that. It's not one species with a single genetic blueprint for all viruses, but a swarm of quasi-species with a variety of genetic variants. And among the swarm, there may be a virus, a quasi-species, capable of eluding immunity and causing severe disease, a mutant that we really do not want to escape. So measles, despite being capable of rapid multiple mutation events, has remained thus far quite stable in terms of the antibody response that it invokes in the host. But the fact that measles is infecting and spreading among those with vaccine-induced immunity means that the wall has already been breached to some extent. I want to talk about escape mutants and imperfect immunity. You see, in spite of the false reassurances given to us about measles vaccine in 1961 and beyond, vaccine-induced immunity is imperfect in many ways. Most concerning of these ways is the bias against an effective ability to kill virus-infected cells. That is the Th1 or cytotoxic immunity. Why? Because we select the vaccine virus based in part upon its ability to produce antibodies, Th2 immunity. And then there are other man-made factors that we add in to the schedule that further modify this response, that drive it further in a Th2 immune response. And those include aluminum and mercury. So you can imagine if you're giving a child a measles-containing vaccines after you've given them vaccines containing aluminum mercury, the immune system is going to be driven preferentially towards antibody production and away from cytotoxic immunity, encouraging the development of escape mutants. So escape mutants of measles virus may be encouraged by the genetic selection pressure of this imperfect response. The virus indeed has already escaped the vaccine-induced immunity of antibodies with two-dose vaccinees being susceptible, especially as the finish have shown us at high dose of exposure. What happens? Experience with horizontal transmission suggests that the vaccine itself may be the source of such a mutant. An escape mutant that eludes the immune response to the vaccine virus in a population with no effective immunity against measles behaves like a virgin soil population. Are we sitting on a time bomb? Will life mimic art? You may know this film, I Am Legend, with Will Smith. A mutated, re-engineered measles virus is developed to kill cancer cells and it produces an apocalypse, killing 94% of those it infects. It infects. Well, we shall see with time. In the meantime, certainty remains the official order of the day. Greg Poland says MMR vaccine does not cause autism. Pasteur said the greatest arrangement of the mind is to believe in something because one wishes it to be so. I come back to Dr. Poland's paper on the age-old struggle against anti-vaccinationists. 
He sees us at the very least as peddlers of bombast and at most, at worst, as child killers. Anti-vaccinationists trend towards complete mistrust of government and manufacturers, conspiratorial thinking, denialism, low cognitive complexity in thinking patterns, reasoning flaws, and a habit of substituting emotional anecdotes for data. It may be of interest to Dr. Poland that there have been two studies on the demographic of those who are resistant to vaccines, those who do not tend to get their, vaccine, their children vaccinated. They come from North America and from Italy, and both studies show that it is in fact those who are better educated, those of higher cognitive complexity perhaps, who are resisting the call for vaccination. In the meantime, those of us suffering low cognitive complexity remain perplexed as to why, if this were not the case, autism affects one in 28 American boys. Why the CDC, the FDA and industry scientists would have to conceal compelling data of a causal association and why the US vaccine court has compensated many vaccine injured children with an autism spectrum disorder. Why? Heidi Larson, based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, you'll remember she's part of the Vaccine Confidence Project, writes on the source of concern for those who dare to question vaccines. She says the growing challenge in the vaccine landscape is that it is no longer isolated individuals who are thinking twice or refusing vaccination, but there are growing groups of people. These movements are about principles of freedom and rights, not about specific vaccines or specific safety concerns. Dr. Larson, how could you have got it so badly wrong? It is a fact that specific safety concerns and the public's demand for rights over vaccine choice are inextricably linked. And in fact, one of the slogans of the main groups campaigning for the choice in this country is where there is risk, there must be choice. In other words, it's the perception of risk, of the danger of the vaccine, that means there must be choice as to whether parents give the vaccine to their children or not. Dr. Larson continues, standing up for rights to freedom of expression, to choice and to respect and dignity are all healthy characteristics of democratic societies. What Larson reduces to healthy characteristics of democratic societies, like a rosy complexion or a good pair of shoes, are actually the very foundations of democracy, hard-won rights in the evolution of a truly democratic civilization. On the matter of trust, she writes, the success of vaccination depends upon the public accepting the voice of experts and government, both of whom are facing waning trust in many countries of the world. I wonder why. This is a series of events that happened in Italy in advance of the general election. And it's written by an employee of GlaxoSmithKline. A while ago, GSK's CEO worldwide, Andrew Whitty from England, met with Italian Premier Matteo Renzi. The Premier said that the pharmaceutical sector was strategic for Italy. He went further. The pharmaceutical industry is precisely the future of our country. How astonishing. Not the children, not the young people, not the workforce of tomorrow, not the Italian people, but the pharmaceutical industry, precisely the future of Italy. The Minister of Health, Lorenzian and other members of the government reiterated the sensitivity of the government towards those who invest and create jobs and opportunities for young people. As for the Italian government, Witte, in return, required a few things. Clear rules and stability in return for strong investment. We are of one intent. Apparently, in order to reinforce her point, in the public eye, Minister Lorenzin went on to tell the Italian public that 270 children had died in a recent measles outbreak in London. The story was in fact complete fabrication. So let me just give you a little update on this anecdote. And that is that what Witte was talking about in terms of clear rules and stability 
stability in the market in return for strong investment was, I'm sure, mandatory vaccination law, law in Italy, and that was subsequently passed. What's more interesting in the last few days as we complete this lecture series is that the Minister of Health, Lorenzin, has now lost her job. The Italian people have had their say, and the party was voted into government, at least in part on the basis that it was going to overturn the mandatory vaccine law. Why is it that governments do deals that trade the lives of their children with companies like GlaxoSmithKline who appear to have worked closely with the European Medicines Agency to keep from the public 69 deaths in infants from their 6-in-1 Infanrix Hexa vaccine? A vaccine that will doubtless become a key commodity in Italy's new mandatory vaccine laws should they stand. This sounds to me very much like the clear rules and stability that GSK's CEO required of the Italian government in return for investment and jobs and the votes that go with them. Perhaps upon reflection we should have heeded Sir Graham Wilson in 1961 when he addressed the National Institutes of Health pointing out that in Scandinavia mortality from measles in the face of universal infection had fallen to one in one million children. And perhaps we should ask, as Pasteur clearly did on his deathbed in coming to the conclusion that Bernard was right, the germ is nothing, the terrain is everything, what is it about that child, that terrain, that makes them vulnerable, rather than the push to universal vaccination, at least in first world countries? It's best described, I believe, by Hornblum a Newman as the utilitarian calculus of convenience, self-interest and the chance of a grand scientific payoff to which I would add a grand financial payoff too. So where does this go? People have talked and written of the coming plague. To my mind and in the minds of many one plague is already here and that is neurodevelopmental and chronic immune system disorders in children and young adults at epidemic levels. Perhaps another waits in the wings while centre stage the battles between German terrain, caution and certainty, profit and loss play out. Waiting in the wings may be an old adversary in the unfamiliar guise of an ambitious understudy, measles. Perhaps they know this. In fact, I suspect they do. In fact, I suspect that this is the reason for their fear, their greatest fear, one of their own creation, one of their own certainty. The certainty that I believe is the fatal flaw of our protagonist, the public health doctor, the vaccinologist. As for that, Ericsson said, every certainty is an empty throne. Those who knew but one path would come to worship it, even as it led to the cliff's edge.